Welcome to the Darwinian Delusions channel. Today we're going to be covering homology, homoplasy, quagmire, part two. The reason why I'm saying part two is because there were some comments in which some people were challenging that particular video through genetics. Now let me just explain what homology and homoplasy quagmire basically means. The Darwinian history of life, the tree of life, is based upon the assumption of homology. This is how they come up with these relationships between humans and chimpanzees and all of uh, the biological diversity we have, how they come up with the tree of life, is by the single assumption of homology. Now firstly, homology is an assumption. It is not an observation. It is not a deduction. It is an assumption. So even, even if there were no problems with homology, it is still an assumption and you can't say it is true in the literal sense. But nonetheless, we know of a direct counterfactual to the assumption of homology, which is homoplasy, which is similarities which cannot be due to common descent. So let's just get this right. Homology is the assumption that similarities are due to common descent, such as a certain skull feature in the human being and a certain skull feature in the chimpanzee. They say, look, look, they're so similar. Therefore, they must have a common ancestor. That's basically homology. But we know of counter examples to homology, which is known as homoplasy, such as the marsupial saber-toothed tiger and the placental saber-toothed tiger. One is from North America, one is from South America, and the placental saber-toothed tiger is closer to the kangaroo than it is to the other marsupial saber-toothed tiger. Yet, if you look at them next to each other, you would say they are identical, yet they are not. Another very powerful example is the bird and the bat. Now, the wing of the bird and the wing of the bat is similar and they both use it for flying. But no Darwinist and no one claims it's due to a common ancestor. This is a well-known example of homoplasy. And if we look at the genetic level, there is actually a similarity between the bat and also the whale in terms of both of them have the same genes for something, for an, an amazing, the amazing phenomena of echolocation. So the contention which was put forth to the previous video on homology and homoplasy uh, in terms of this quagmire, that genetics solves it, well, genetics doesn't actually solve it. Whether you look at, and this is absolutely phenomenal when you think about it, when you look at anatomical traits or genetic traits or biochemical traits, there is homology, homoplasy problem at every single level. It doesn't go away. It's actually perennial. It's here to stay and it's not actually going to go anywhere no matter how much Darwinists are going to pray for this to actually go somewhere. It's not going to go. In fact, you will find books written by secular mainstream academics and univer mainstream universities publishing them in which you will find the same homology, homoplasy, quagmire. For example, parsimony, Phylogeny and Genomics, published by Oxford University, uh, Conceptual Problems in Evolution by MIT University, and also Evidence in Evolution, The Logic Behind the Science, published by Cambridge University. And also, just a few weeks ago, there was a paper published by evolutionary biologists. It was called Molecular Phylogenetics and the Perennial Problem of Homology. That was by Ford Doolittle and Andrew Inkpen. So, homology, homoplasy, is not gonna go anywhere. That quagmire is here to stay and you Darwinists have to deal with it. Thank you very much for listening.